again, um, if, if uh, people could take their seats and um, stop the talking in the uh, aisles, uh, we could get the program started. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get started, everyone. If everyone could uh, cease their conversations. The one thing about the Washington Lawyers Committee is they're tough on timing. And uh, so we got to get started early, or, or, uh, or at least on time. So very much appreciated. So as I said, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Neil Eggleston. I'm a partner at Kirkland & Ellis here in DC. And this year, I was honored to be uh, asked to be the chair of the Wiley A. Branton Awards Luncheon for the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. I must say, it is such a treat to see so many friends, supporters, and advocates today. We are very glad to have you with us to celebrate the important work of the committee promoting civil rights and racial equality. I want to be sure um, to recognize, although I think I'll wait a second for that, to recognize some uh, dignitaries who are here. Thank you all for joining us as we celebrate the accomplishments of the committee that are made possible by the clients, law firms, and businesses from the region and beyond. Today is a special day for many reasons. First, we are actually here in person. So for obvious reasons, we haven't really been in person uh, recently, and as I look out over this crowd, I am so thrilled. Um, the, the Washington Lawyers Committee told me that we're sold out, that uh, people were submitting their uh, lists of people for their tables this morning, as if they do this in the last 20 minutes before the event starts. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort goes into putting all this together. So let me, let me, um, let me go uh, uh, back. Just to mention a few dignitaries who are here, Beverly Brant and Lamberson, uh, Patricia Campbell-Smith and John Farron are all here and we very much appreciate your attendance uh, at this event. So the second, a second reason that we're excited to be here and you will hear more about this later is that we get the opportunity to honor a brave group of tenants who continue to fight for housing justice here in the Washington, D.C. area. Third, we are here honoring someone who is part of the DNA of the committee and has spent decades advocating for fairness and respect for all people. Fourth, we honor the pro bono partners over the past year with outstanding achievement awards. Finally, and I'm really excited about this, we get to welcome new leadership uh, to the committee. I also want to thank the law firms, corporations, and individuals who gave generously so that we could raise more than $1 million for the committee through this event. And in addition, I am grateful to the members of the Branton Committee who worked so hard with me and with so many others to make this possible, and I want to make a special thanks to all of you. You can view our impressive list of sponsors in our digital program by scanning the QR code on the menus at your table. Please don't ask me how this works. After, <laughs> after two years of COVID, I still can't get to the menu at a restaurant. Um, and maybe I'm secretly uh, pleased that the paper menus are coming back. <clears throat> but in any event, I hope you're appreciative that we are sensitive to our environment and using the QR codes in, instead of paper. So let me get to recognize uh, some firms that have been particularly helpful. I want to thank our leading sponsor. How about that? Kirkland and Ellis, of which I am a partner. Yeah. 
We also want to thank Evershed Sutherland for their remarkable support as a freedom sponsor. In addition, let's support and thank our justice sponsor for their remarkable support, Covington and Burling, Latham and Watkins, Sidley and Austin, and Wilmer Hale. And I won't read the next off, but the next group, as you will see on the screen, are our integrity sponsors. Thank you to all of them. And now our advocacy sponsors, who are also on the screen, thanks to all of them as well. I'm just so pleased that so many of the great law firms and uh, in the city have really seen fit to step up and support this wonderful organization. And I think you'll feel even better about it as we go through the substantive program during the course of the day. We also want you to check out the program book and signs here today to see our impact, truth, and legacy sponsors. And finally, we want to thank our corporate advisory board members, for which I thought there was also a slide. <laughs> there we go. This <laughs> Unfortunately, a little snafus happened at trial too, right? All you guys know that. We are deeply grateful to, for, their, for your support. I also want to recognize Relativity, who has joined us today for including the committee in their Justice for Change program. Thank you. Now it is my, sorry. I, sorry, I stepped on the applause line. Um, now it is my distinct uh, pleasure to introduce Claudia Withers, Chief Operating Officer at Civil Rights Corps, who is a co-chair of the Board of Directors of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. I want to thank you, Neil, and thank you for your terrific leadership of the Branton Committee and making today a success. At the Washington Lawyers Committee, we have a wonderful group of law firm associates who volunteer as associate trustees and campaign coordinators for the Associates Campaign. This year we had a record number of firms participate. Not only was the participation incredible, impressive, but more than half the firms broke their fundraising records. Combined, they raised over $350,000 to support the committee. Look at the amounts. Look at the amounts raised by our top three firms in each category. And it's not me. Here we go. In addition to raising important funds, the Associates Campaign is an outstanding education program as the Associates use client stories and advocacy efforts to spur their colleagues to, to give. It's fabulous. Thank you to all the associate volunteers for their inspirational fundraising efforts. You give us hope for the future of civil rights. Each year at the Branton Awards Luncheon, we honor the law firms and legal nonprofits that partner with us to dismantle injustice and pursue lasting change. Each year, the committee presents a series of outstanding achievement awards for exceptional commitment for civil rights and racial justice. These awards recognize some of the area lawyers, law firms, and organizations that have contributed thousands of hours of their time co-counseling with the committee, joining with us to advocate for significant, even groundbreaking change. Today, we are going to get deeper insights into some of the cases that are being recognized with outstanding achievement awards. We will hear directly from the people involved, beginning with our suit that held the district accountable for providing COVID testing that was accessible. Take a look. One of the most effective tools to slow the spread of COVID-19 is testing. Yet, DC's at-home testing program left blind residents isolated and unable to confirm their diagnosis. One time they asked St. Teresa 
uh, what was the uh, most worst disease among people? And her answer was isolation. And I say that because as a blind person, I really felt isolation uh, during the pandemic because as a blind person, we have to touch everything. You know, go down the stairs, you gotta touch the doorknob, you gotta touch the railing. Um, and with COVID, people were so afraid that blind people wasn't touching anything. <laughs> and then the other thing, as a blind person, you need people to assist you. Um, and they didn't do that during COVID. I mean, I just felt isolated. With the COVID test, they wasn't, a, they wasn't accessible to a blind person. Um, probably not accessible to a sighted person. But the instructions, we couldn't read it because uh, it was in print. Uh, and the interpretation of being able to say, go to this website. Now, you know, everybody take for granted that everyone has a uh, computer. That's not true. Um, just a little background. First of all, uh, for a blind person, buying a computer, $500 to $1,000. Second, you have to get the software, which is JAWS. That's anywhere from $900 to $1,200. Then you have to get uh, have an internet service, which is about $100 a month. Then you have to have the training how to use the computer and all that. And that's anywhere from $45 to $60 an hour, and it takes you at least about 100 hours to learn how to do that. So most of the average blind person could not have a computer to be able to access the information, to be able to use or, or record or get, um, you know, the information that we needed. Uh, if you thought you had COVID uh, and you needed to uh, uh, take the test, you could, it was a visual print, so you could not read the test to get the instructions how to take it. And because you might have COVID, a family member or a friend did not want to come over and read it was just no way to uh, find out if we had COVID, if a person got COVID, and, and then what to do about it, what to follow instructions, where to go, who to contact. So it was just uh, a nightmare. The Washington Lawyers Committee filed a complaint to address this inaccessible public health program. In November 2022, DC agreed to maintain an accessible Test Yourself DC program that includes in-home testing assistance, screen reader accessible online instructions, and outreach to the disability community. When the Washington Lawyers Committee came along with Maggie, it gave us uh, someone in our corner if we had any type of uh, barriers, problems, discrimination against us, we had a, num we had a lifeline of uh, organization we could call to assist us. And I mean, that gives you a lot of uh, good sleep at night to know that you have that in your Rolodex. Thank you to Shepard Mullen for your work on this case to make DC COVID testing accessible to people who are blind and for your ongoing work defending disability rights. <laughs> Patients at St. Elizabeth's, DC's only public psychiatric hospital, have been subjected to unconscionable conditions during multiple emergencies. When water to the hospital was shut off in 2019 due to a bacterial contamination, DC's mismanagement led patients to experience more than 30 days with limited or no access to showers, other basic hygiene, critical treatment, and hot food. Only a few months later, the district failed to protect patients again during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result of this inaction, the mortality rate of patients was 40 times that of the public. A resulting preliminary injunction brought transmission down dramatically, and in February 2023, the patients settled, requiring the city to implement better emergency preparedness procedures for the future. We are incredibly grateful to Arnold and Porter and the ACLU of DC for their work on behalf of the patients at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Ms. Wheeler, a student at American University, mutually resolved her lawsuit against American University and the DC Metropolitan Police Department. American University declared the commitment to the safety, security, and well-being of all students and the entire university community. 
the university will retain a third-party consultant to assist with its regular periodic review of its policies and procedures regarding its responses to reports of situations involving students having social, emotional, behavioral, or medical difficulties, which may involve wellness checks and involuntary hospitalizations. Today, we honor Jones Day for outstanding work representing Ms. Wheeler against American University and the DC Police. That's extraordinary work. I want to have you please applaud again for the extraordinary work of all these award, award recipients. I'm about to invite my co-chair, Jamie Gardner, from Paul Hastings up to the podium from, for some very special remarks. But first, I want to take a moment to recognize all of our board members. Would all of the members of the Washington Lawyers Committee Board please stand? These are a wonderful group of committed volunteers who provide guidance and support almost every day. I know I speak for Jamie when I tell you that our gratitude knows no bounds. Thank you. Jamie? Got to find my place. Thank you, Claudia. I could not have asked for a better partner to co-chair the Board of Directors with than you, so thank you. What a year this has been, and it's only June. Thank you again to everyone who's here. It's an amazing group, and we're, your presence here means so much to us. In many ways, it feels like a big family reunion, lots of old friends and new faces. We have the pleasure of, I have the pleasure of introducing someone very special in a few minutes, but First, I want to recognize someone who has been the fearless leader of this organization for the past seven years, including through the pandemic and so much more. Jonathan Smith's commitment and passionate advocacy have made this organization better and stronger than ever. Now, for those of you who know Jonathan, you know that he hates being in the spotlight, so we didn't tell him we were going to do this. <laughs> Surprise. John, can you please stand and let us recognize your remarkable leadership and unwavering compassion. I hope you see that by this great outpouring of appreciation how much you mean to this community, so thank you. We're excited to, to uh, tell everyone that Jonathan will be continuing with us in a newly created position as senior special counsel. As many of you know, John has been a tireless supporter, a tireless advocate um, for changing policing in this country. And he's also shined a light on the horrible and inhumane conditions for those who are incarcerated. He will now focus his remarkable talents on those issues full time. John, we can't wait to see what you will accomplish. John's new role has allowed us to uh, bring on new leadership at the committee. Uh, I'm thrilled to say that we were able to bring on a person who has demonstrated throughout her career that civil rights and racial, racial justice were her guiding light. So please welcome Joanne Lynn, the new executive director of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. <laughs> as Joanne prepares to come to the podium, indulge me as I tell you a little bit more about why we knew that she was the right person to lead this organization. Joanne brings 25 years of civil and human rights legal experience to our organization. She started her career representing women and children in family law, restraining orders, and immigration matters. She handled complex immigration cases, including appeals in the federal courts. 
After relocating to Washington, D.C. almost 20 years ago, Joanne has led policy and ab policy advocacy at several leading, right, leading human rights organizations, including the ACLU and Amnesty International. In 2021, Joanne received the Women's Leadership Award from the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Joanne brings a remarkable mix of direct legal experience and strategic advocacy at all levels of government. I'm thrilled to invite Joanne to the mic to tell you more about what's in store for the committee. <laughs> I was telling everybody as I, you were coming in that I really do feel like this is a civil rights prom <laughs> that was organized by everybody else and I get to arrive as the queen and just enjoy all the benefits. So thank you to everybody. Uh, J Jamie, thank you for your very kind, gracious invitation and thank you to Claudia and Neil for your tireless service and insuperable leadership of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. It is a joy to partner with you each and every day. So I'm in week 12 of the job, still in my newbie honeymoon phase, and I really mean this when I say I have the best job in the world. Every day I get to partner with the nation's leading law firms in pursuit of racial justice and equity. Every day, I stride into the office, eager to greet the day and to work side by side with our immensely talented staff. Will the staff of the Washington Lawyers Committee please stand and be recognized? So as you look around the room, we are a small but mighty, mighty army of 30 staff, including attorneys, paralegals, advocates, fundraisers, and business operations specialists. Our staff have deep expertise and passion in the areas of fair housing, education equity, workers' rights, criminal legal system reform, and immigrant justice. Their dedication is unparalleled, and I have the privilege of learning from them each and every day. Still, we could not do what we do without the partnership of our board, pro bono attorneys, donors, and community partners. Together, we pool resources, expertise, and human power to pursue racial justice and equity here in the DMV and beyond. In Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, there are dozens of national public interest law organizations, and there are many local D.C. legal services providers. But the Washington Lawyers Committee is the blend of both worlds. We work alongside community, local communities of color on cutting edge racial justice issues, at an organization of national impact and import. Finally, a few thoughts on where we are today and what does it mean to strive for racial justice and equity in 2023? It's easy to forget that the killing of George Floyd took place three years ago. It's easy to forget that the national reckoning that gripped the country in 2020 has not resulted in any major reforms needed to address centuries of ensla enslavement, Jim Crow, and systemic discrimination and violence that persists today. Just a few weeks ago, on June 15th, the DC City Council held a day-long hearing on a DC reparations bill. This hearing was historic. The first public hearing on reparations in the district. I was proud to join a chorus of community leaders calling on the DC Council to move forward swiftly with reparations as a legal, 
economic, and moral imperative. It's easy to forget that Washington, D.C. was built on lands annexed from Potomac slave plantations. It's easy to forget that right outside this hotel, the White House and U.S. Capitol were built by enslaved Africans whose owners were recompensed for slave labor. It's easy to forget that in, in addition to being the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. was a thoroughfare for the U.S. domestic slave trade, with traffickers selling enslaved persons throughout the South. Frederick Douglass called Washington, D.C. the very citadel of slavery. White supremacy was thus interwoven with the founding, construction, and development of the district, the nation's capital, and the United States of America. Here in the district, the through lines from enslavement to Jim Crow to racial inequities today are apparent. Since 1970, DC's black population has dropped from 71% to 41% today. This steady decline in DC's black population corresponds with a steady increase in DC's housing costs. Today, the average home value for black households in the DC region is about two thirds the home value for white households. For lower and middle income families, home ownership remains the single most important source of wealth accumulation and financial security. Therefore, DC's long-standing patterns of housing segregation and disparities have robbed and continue to actively rob black families of the opportunity to build wealth. The racial gap in the DMV is colossal. White households own 81 times the wealth of black households. We all know full well the pernicious racism in our criminal law system. DC black men are more than eight times as likely to be stopped by police as DC white men. In a city that is 46% black, the prison population is 90% black. For returning citizens seeking to rebuild their lives after prison, many find themselves shut out, excluded from housing and employment, thereby trapping families in generational cycles of poverty and incarceration. As lawyers, we're trained in the importance of precedent, honoring the constraints posed by precedent. Reparations has historical and legal precedent here in the district. In 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed DC emancipation into law, leading to the emancipation of nearly 3,000 3, people. At the same time, he authorized reparations to those who owned and enslaved Africans. Therefore, DC has a long established history of reparations dating back 160 years ago. It was just reparations to the wrong people. Reparations to those who trafficked, beat, and killed black people. DC is hardly the vanguard when it comes to modern day reparations. In recent years, the cities of Evanston, Illinois and San Francisco have developed and implemented reparations. The state of California has established a task force to study and make recommendations on reparations in California, the most populous state of the nation. Closer to home, Georgetown University has authorized reparations for the descendants of people once enslaved and trafficked by Georgetown. 
Finally, as lawyers, we understand how our civil legal system is grounded in the concept of providing remedies for wrongs committed. The practice of quantifying damage to calculate compensation is central to the operation of our torts, contracts, employment, environment, discrimination laws. Every day, juries across the country calculate sums to compensate for harm, whether that's for lost wages, property damaged, injury suffered, illness, even death. Every day, judges across the country issue injunctive orders, ordering actors to halt action or to take immediate action to avoid irreparable harm. There is nothing new or radical about reparations. The precedent of reparations is long established in the district and at the national level. The concept of payment for harm done and injuries suffered is woven into the fabric of our laws and civil justice system. In 2023, as the DC Council takes up reparations, let us consider what we as citizens, as attorneys, as a bar, as a city, what we owe to those who built the district and the nation's capital. Let us consider what we must do to redress the long lasting effects of enslavement, Jim Crow, and white supremacy. Thank you for being vital partners in this fight for racial justice and equity today, tomorrow, and beyond. We hope that you enjoyed hearing about our work in our first video because I have the honor of introducing our next courageous client, Sabrina Jones. Breaking down barriers to employment has national racial justice impact for our returning citizens, which I truly believe is an extension of reparations in the employment and workers' rights context. Please enjoy. There's, there's a lot of things that you uh, go through as far as um, trying to re-entry back into uh, being a productive citizen. Um, in this game, unfortunately, it's, it's pretty much who you know, you know, to be able to get a job, um, a, a great job. I wouldn't even apply for certain jobs because I felt that I was going to be turned away. So I just told my in my head that, you know, they're going to deny you, don't even apply. So I pretty much did that for a few years. But after that, I, you know, I got out of my own way and just, you know, start applying for jobs that pretty much would tell you no, but I still went out and did it anyway. Um, I, I applied for a couple jobs that I felt that I was um, good for. And um, of course, during the interview and everything, um, I put down that I had felonies where, you know, he doesn't really say anything about the felony, but there's a big habit in you know? him. But I know when I leave out of the room, I know I'm not going to hear from this person ever again. You know, it's unfortunately, we can read the room more than they think we can read the room. We, you know, so. We want to get out there and we want to work. So it's very vital that we um, put these ex-offenders um, in the right place to get help, especially when they want it.
when I first talked to Joanna, um, of course I was real happy because I feel as though my life didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Um, I felt like the issue that I was going through didn't matter. And um, talking with her, and she, you know, let me know that it did matter. Being an ex-offender, living in Washington, D.C., and constantly being reconvicted and reconvicted and reconvicted over and over for something that I did over decades ago, you know? And um, she let me know that that's not okay. It's not okay. And let us see what we can do about this. We might can't change the world, but we're going to start right here and change this. Don't, don't stop believing in yourself and don't stop believing in the good of others. That to keep trying and to know that a better day is coming and a better day is here. In February 2023, Haynes and Boone, the Washington Lawyers Committee, and First Transit Incorporated, a global leader in transportation services, announced that First Transit will further develop their equal opportunity hiring process. The enhanced process will increase its diversity, equity, and inclusion objectives and create economic opportunity in the communities in which First Transit operates. Like many major employers, First Transit conducts background checks to screen whether prospective employees have criminal records as a part of its hiring process. Following discussions with Haynes and Boone, the committee, and an expert consultant, First Transit has thoughtfully renewed and refreshed its background check policies. The new policy relies on rigorous recidivism research to continue to ensure that qualified persons have the opportunity to work and succeed. They will not be unnecessarily excluded from employment due to prior criminal records that data supports have no impact on their ability to safely do their job. Haynes and Boone, the committee, and First Transit recognize that overly broad policies can result in the exclusion of qualified applicants of color. Today, we recognize Haynes and Boone for their work to expand job opportunities and provide second chances. Three Virginia Tech students were sued by their employer, Bookholders, after they stood up against being paid below the minimum wage and were threatened by the company's CEO. In January 2023, the Maryland District Court found that Bookholders' actions ran afoul of Maryland law, in part because the company had sued the students in bad faith and attempted to inhibit the students' complaints to the government. Thank you to Public Justice and Murphy Anderson for defending the rights of these students, a truly outstanding achievement. For several years, BDO has provided crucial pro bono services addressing racial discrimination against workers and people of color. Their expert assistance was invaluable in multiple cases on behalf of black police officers in Maryland facing racial discrimination in the workplace. BDO's analysis of future earnings, including promotions, overtime, pensions, Social Security, and more, was critical to a $1.2 million settlement. They also played a role in our case fighting for workers that had been terminated without notice and who later received a court award of $700,000 in unpaid wages, overtime, and other damages. Today, we recognize BDO for their important work. So you've now heard uh, two videos, or heard and watched two videos, and you've heard from some of the representatives of the Washington Lawyers Committee. I just want to add to what others have said, first about Jonathan. Jonathan, you have just done a remarkable job leading this organization for so many years, and I'm so pleased that you're staying on to work in issues of um, the policing and incarceration. You are one of the world's leading experts and recognized by both sides as a leading expert, as a person who's really trying to bring solutions to these problems, and I wanna thank you for that.
And, and let me just also say, now that you've heard Joanne, you can uh, tell just how excited I am that she's going to be the next leader of the Washington Lawyers Committee. She'll just do a fantastic job. You can tell her level of passion and commitment, and she's going to spend every minute of every day working on the pro kinds of problems that you've heard about today. And I really thank you, Joanne, for being willing to lead this organization. So you might be thinking to yourself, didn't we already hear from him? Like, what is he doing up there? Well, as you can tell, I'm kind of the money guy. So I'm here to make a special appeal to all of you. Um, I'd like to ask you to think about making an additional gift to the Washington Lawyers Committee to help the work that Joanne and so many people in the organization are going to be working on uh, during the next uh, year and longer. As you all know, the headwinds are strong, and each week seems to bring about more challenges that we thought were not possible before. Every gift, no matter how small, is important to uh, giving the resources to this organization to do the kind of work that you saw in those videos. Now, on your tables, there's a card, and it should be in front of each place I mentioned this a little bit earlier, although I didn't hold up a card. It's got a QR code. And again, by now you all know what a QR code looks like. And you all, because of the restaurant business, as I said before, know how to use it. So if you, if you use this QR code now, back at your offices, when you get home tonight, it will bring you to a donation page. And you'll have the opportunity to make an additional donation or a donation to the Washington uh, Lawyers Committee. I can't urge you enough to really uh, sort of think about it and dig deeply because this is just a terrific organization working for real people who really need all of our help. And so I just urge you to think about it now, later at your office, when you get home tonight, tomorrow. Just, just uh, really think about how each of you individually, not necessarily just through your law firms, but each of you individually can work to help the business and the work that this organization uh, spends so much effort uh, really devoted to, and I thank you very much. Now, um, it's time for lunch. Uh, the way the Washington Lawyers Committee does this is the lunch, it's like 20 minutes or something, and then they get going again, and you'll all still be eating, and that's all fine. So we'll turn to lunch. And, uh, and then we'll resume the program after lunch. Mm -hmm.